Scott Jordan and Mark Warner here for Jancast number 161 for Thursday, January 18th, 2024. Hello there, Mark. And we have a special guest with us today, too. We have Steve Cooper with us. And Steve uh, is somebody that is highly educated, Scott and I, on topics that we're going to get into in a minute. Yeah, so we're really looking forward to that. Stuff we didn't um, know about. Yep. Steve actually reached out and engaged us after the last Jancast that released. He and thousands of others, but yep. Steve is the one that uh, inspired us. So uh, I, the reason for this and having Steve on is directly related to our last podcast, yep. right, Scott? Yep, yep. We got got a lot of feedback, and uh, Steve reached out and said, uh, "We don't know what we're talking about." <laughs> no, he did not say that. <laughs> well, something like that, but but it was in a nice way. And, and well, we we really don't know what we're talking about based on our conversation with him. And that's why we said we got to get this guy on the show because I mean we were ignorant of some of the facts, right? So what Steve pointed out is that we made a mistake of generalizing. Yes. Right. right. So. And it's always dangerous to generalize. So we made some carte blanche statements about how electrostatic sprayers are perceived and how they uh, do or don't do what they say they're supposed to do. And we were um, corrected that, you know, when you generalize, that might be a true statement in general, but it's not true for every individual piece of technology. And Steve comes to us with a background in engineering. He's led multiple companies that have been engaged with uh, very unique processes related to spraying, specifically electrostatic spraying. Um, yep. Steve has a background in uh, spraying, I guess you would call it more cosmetics, like uh, tanning solutions. Um, Things like disinfectants, yep. things like agriculture. Um, so we got into a great conversation about you know some of that, some of my background with electrostatic paint spraying. And uh, Steve, as an engineer, was able to point out that paint and disinfectants are not the same. And I was like, well, I guess that's a fair <laughs> statement. But uh, with all that, Steve, we're thrilled to have you on the program when... Yeah. We spoke last week, uh, it was enlightening for all of us. And yeah. so we felt that in the, in the vein of Jancast.com and what we try to do with transparency and good karma, that the right thing to do would be to, you know, offer some new education and knowledge to our audience that we didn't know before. So yeah. thank you for joining us, Steve. I did you a little little bit of an intro, but I thought I might throw it over to you to kind of expound on where I might have been light. All right. Well, first off, thanks for having me, you guys. Uh, I do enjoy your podcast and congratulations on 20 years. So thank you. Yeah. let's get together 20 years from now and we'll review this one. <laughs> yeah. But uh, my background is in, I'm an engineer, but uh, I was fortunate enough to go to the University of Georgia. And when I was a student there, I um, I got involved with this laboratory called the Applied Electrostatics Laboratory run by Dr. Ed Law. And as a student, um, I was working in the lab and then I became a graduate student. Now, this was just a short time ago, 1983, maybe. Hmm. So I probably designed my first electrostatic nozzle in 1984. And these uh, were primarily designed for agricultural pesticides. I mean, the main objective of electrostatic spraying is to improve the mass transfer. That's the amount of spray that comes out of the nozzle and actually gets on the target, but also to improve the spray coverage on hidden areas. And in agriculture, it's like underneath leaf surfaces and things like that. Mm -hmm. If you're spraying crops in agriculture, the pests don't all sit on top of the leaf ready to get hit with the in insecticide, they hide. And so uh, the, the work was to improve that process. But it was also geared to using less environmentally persistent pesticides and safer type pesticides, too. So electrostatic spraying is all about improving the amount of spray that goes on the target and where it goes on hidden areas, especially. So that turned out to be a pretty successful project. I stayed at that lab from oh, 83 to 88. And then I started a company called Electrostatic Spraying Systems. And... Um, that company was building uh, 
sprayers for ornamental crops, for agricultural crops, a lot of high value specialty vegetable crops. And um, in around 1998, I, I got interested in expanding uh, electrostatic spraying into some other types of of applications. And one of them that really took off was called Mystic Tan. It was a, a spray booth. You got in it, it sprayed a, um, a, a cosmetic uh, tan, and it really, really worked well. Uh, it took off because the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders all used it, and <laughs> and it, it really was a hit. Uh, we were one of the first corporate sponsors of the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, as a matter of fact. So wow. that funded more research into electrostatic spraying. And I got interested in disinfecting um, when I got involved with BioPlanet. Uh, BioPlanet was a company that got started because there was outbreaks of norovirus on cruise ships and they were mm -hmm. helping to organize some cruise events and we're having a lot of cancellations and a lot of problems with that because of norovirus. This was back in 2010. So they were using equipment from my old company, ESS, which is electrostatic spraying systems, and it was working well. They were doing a good job, and they were eliminating some of these cases of norovirus. It was having a great impact on the cruise industry, but the equipment wasn't holding up. It, it wasn't holding up, and so they contacted me and says, hey, can I work with them a little bit and help them design a system that was more tuned in to using um, electrostatics with disinfectants? Every project I've ever worked on with electrostatic sprays, you have to kind of design the electrostatic system for the application that you're doing. And disinfectants are different because they're very electrically conductive. And so the electrostatic sprayer had to be completely redeveloped for that. They're also, um, you know, you need to take in, into consideration material compatibility, types of plastics, types of metals that you use, things like that. So a little bit of background, that's kind of the history of how I got in, you know, got involved in electrostatics all the way to the place where I am now, where I'm working with BioPlanet uh, every day and uh, working towards making disinfecting uh, better by improving the spray application and using electrostatics. Now, in, in your last podcast, you talked about electrostatics and you sort of lumped it all together because a lot of electrostatic sprayers came out during COVID. They came out of the woodwork. Yeah, yeah. There were 20 five, I think that I identified, you know, that came out and people were selling them and making some claims about, hey, you can just use this sprayer and it'll magically disinfect. And I thought immediately that it was basically teaching people how to do a bad job disinfecting because, <laughs> because yeah. once you give somebody a silver bullet and say, you don't need to worry about everything else, then you know, they're not going to do as good of a job. And, and I know that disinfecting is not just the sprayer. It's the, it's the good tools, the sprayer, but it's also, you know, selecting the right chemistry and having good training so that you can select the right chemistry and know how to use the equipment and know the proper PPE. And none of this was being discussed. It was basically right. by the sprayer and it's magic. Yeah. And so I got involved in testing a lot of these sprayers because we have a, a spray test lab here. And um, and I was disappointed that the sprayers that were calling themselves electrostatic that were hitting the market really weren't performing very well at all. And yeah. I wouldn't call them electrostatic. I, I liked how you summed it up when we spoke last week. Um, you broke it into four primary categories of things that an electrostatic sprayer successful application would require. Maybe you can share those four things. Okay, well, I'll be telling everybody how to make a good electrostatic sprayer if I do that. Well, so. it's not quite that easy. <laughs> no, I'm sure no. you you can get you can tell somebody the ingredients to a cake, but that doesn't mean they can okay. bake one. Well, if it's indicative <laughs> of the technology that's in the the other companies that are out there, you pointed out something that Mark and I really hadn't focused on and ties in with Mark's question is the chemical part of it. A lot of these sprayers work great with water, but you're not yeah. disinfecting with water, right? So there's a whole different right. story when you when you when you have a quat disinfectant versus water. So all these demos that these people are doing were essentially fake, right? I mean, yeah, they, they were. were. I mean, you could s sell an electrostatic sprayer by spraying water and saying, "Gee, look how well it coats," right. but you know, then you put disinfectant in it. And two minutes later, it's not doing that same job. But really, just to get back, there's there's 
really four key critical elements to making a high performing electrostatic sprayer or really just an electrostatic sprayer that's medium performing. You have to have good spray charge. Mm -hmm. So spray charge is a very easily measurable thing. Uh, it's uh, units are millicoulombs per kilogram. That's charge to mass ratio. You know, that basically is just how many electrons are you putting on these spray droplets? If you don't put enough on, you're not going to motivate the spray to coat better, wrap around against gravity or air currents. So spray charge has got to be above one millicoulomb per kilogram. That's a pretty well-known number in my world. Um, and we try to shoot for two or three millicoulombs per kilogram as our charge to mass ratio. So charge is important, but equally as important and very critical is droplet size. Right. If the droplet size is too big, it doesn't matter how high you charge it, it's going to fall because gravity is now the dominant force. So right. uh, spray charge is important. Droplet size is important. And you also don't want droplet sizes that are too small because they tend to linger and they don't wet enough on the surface to give you the contact time or the dwell time that you need with yeah. disinfectants because that's important. So droplet size and charge, very important. Third thing on the list for critical things to make a good electrostatic sprayer is propulsion. You need some force to move the spray from the nozzle to the target zone. People want to spray quickly and, and they want to direct the spray uh, it's very hard to train somebody to spray with a very weak spray. You want some propulsion. But for electrostatics, it's important to send that spray cloud to the target zone because the guiding equation of electrostatics is F equals QE, force of attraction equals droplet charge times E, which is the electric field of all those other droplets. So you're creating this electric field around the target. The way you do that is you propel the cloud somewhere. In fact, when I train on how to spray, I say, remember, the spray goes where the air flows because we use in our equipment air propulsion. And it's easy to train that way because people can see the spray move and the spray is entrained in air. So spray goes where the air flows. But that teaches automatically that if you're spraying a refrigerator, <laughs> it's not going to cover the backside. You have to get between the wall and the refrigerator because I had seen some claims made by other manufacturers where they were claiming that you could spray the front of this refrigerator and magically it's going to coat the backside. And I'm like, no, it's not going to do that. Right. So so the last thing on the list. Well, I, before you go to that, I remember you you said something that struck with me. And, and that was, you know, if if the first couple of things that you talked about aren't right, you know, as soon as you look down at your shoes, <laughs> yeah, that's good. if your shoes are all wet, then you got too big a droplet size or you've got no propulsion going on. And and it took me back to some of the tests that Scott and I did. And sure yeah. enough, I remember looking down going, huh? <laughs> the shoes are all wet. <laughs> we, we have a, yeah, we have a spray test lab here that um, can measure how much spray goes on the target and where it goes. And we're doing a lot of tests with a lot of equipment, and we didn't see very good deposition from a lot of these sprayers that were calling themselves electrostatic. And so we started measuring. We're trying to figure out, well, where's the spray going? So we put targets in other places, and the off-target deposition to your shoes or your pants or the floor right in front of you was 10, 15 times higher than it was on the target that we were aiming at. So, yes. Hey, we it, we it was, love that in the chemical business. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, if you want to pump a lot of chemistry, just waste it. But that's not really not my mindset. I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, the, the last thing, though, on the list, and I think very important and often overlooked, is <clears throat> consistency. If you make a good electrostatic sprayer, but it only works good with water, or it only works good with one or two different types of chemistries, or it doesn't work well over time and is inconsistent, then that's, that's not a success. So the last thing on the list is consistency over time and over use with a lot of different chemistries. So spray charge is important. Droplet size is important. Propulsion is important. And then um, consistency. Is I, I uh, wanted you to kind of touch on something else that you had said when we talked, Steve, and that was some units may work well for a minute or two and then they stop working and that really isn't something that had occurred to me prior um you know you would assume that if you're doing it for a minute it's going to be the same 10 minutes from now but 
to yeah. find out that there was such a degradation in performance over really over a couple of minutes alone uh, that surprised me that was something I didn't know also can you touch on that well the first test we do on electrostatic sprayers is measure spray charge and our standard protocol which is helped set up by the University of Georgia is a five tank test so you put water in it first to get a baseline and measure spray charge then you put we we have about four or five different chemistries of different categories in there so you put like a quat in there and we're noticing on all of the sprayers that we tested that um we're were I'd say the low end, less expensive kind of sprayers that had just come out, the charge dropped immediately. When I say immediately, within a half a tank, dropped to wow. drop to. It, none of them started off above one milli coulomb per kilogram at all, but they dropped to a tenth of that, like almost beyond the ability for us to measure with our equipment right away. And we realized that all of these sprayers were using a method of spray charging called contact charging. It's not the choice I would make if I was designing an electrostatic sprayer for disinfecting. Contact charging is not a, a way to get good charge to mass ratio, but the problem with contact charging is it puts a voltage on the liquid itself. And so as soon as the sprayer finds a leakage path to ground, which conductive uh, disinfectants will do almost immediately, then the charge goes to, to zero. And so anything that to differentiate the different types of electrostatic sprayers out there for disinfecting, you need to be aware of, is it a contact charging device or is it an induction charging device? So the successful electrostatic sprayers on the market use a method of charging called induction. It's a non-contact method. The, in, the disinfectant doesn't touch the electrode. The liquid is grounded. So you don't have to <laughs> worry about high voltages leaking off. So the, not to get too too technical, but th th that's really the differentiating factor of why certain sprayers are working and certain sprayers aren't. It's the type of charging method they're picking. Does that explain why Scott had such a shocking experience <laughs> once doing one of his demos? Yeah, that, that one unit, if you touch the thing in the back, it was like, ooh, oh, okay. Yeah, I one of the... One of, the other, me up. <laughs> yeah, one of the other problems with contact <laughs> charging is that the liquid is at a high voltage. And in order to get kind of a semi-decent charge from a contact, you have to put about 25,000 volts on that liquid. Oh. So if you're holding a device in your hand and it's leaking current, eventually you're going to feel that. And <laughs> there's been several devices that have been thrown <laughs> because, because of that. But but uh, that that's not true with induction charging devices. And that's the, the technology that we've implemented for disinfecting at BioPlanet. And it's really a very novel way to charge spray and it's very reliable, but it's also very safe. Hmm. Well, that leads me to a question I wanted to ask you. <clears throat> Scott and I talk a lot about um, our involvement in industry standards. And during our conversation, you know, one of the things that came up, which was near and dear to my heart, was talking about the need for standards as it relates to electrostatics, whether it is uh, standards in their use or whether it's standards in how they're measured. Um, so I, I really like that conversation and have had the opportunity to kind of put it out there to some of my peers that there's a need to mm -hmm. do it and um, to dive into it deeper and not get caught up in doing generalization state generalized <laughs> statements about things. So um, I, I, do you see that uh, as coming down the road? I know there was some talk about um, EPA working on uh, standards as it related to chemicals used in yeah. electrostatic sprayers, but yeah, there's a new protocol out there. Yeah, yeah but I, I think you brought up the idea that there's a need to have a kind of a standard wrapped around what can and can't be done or should be done or what's the goal or expectation of a good electrostatic sprayer. So do you see that coming down the pipe? Yeah, I see that it's it's needed. I'm with you on that. Um, we've been working uh, for the last year and a half on creating standard uh, because it's come up from the U.S. from the uh, from the EPA, from the University of Georgia that we've had conversations about how do you differentiate an electrostatic sprayer so that you can even call it an electrostatic sprayer. Right. So it's not hard to to really measure spray charge. So 
measuring spray charge is part of it, establishing a benchmark of at least one millicoulomb per kilogram. That's accepted in research, peer-reviewed research. And also um, having, having the claim substantiated. If you say you're an electrostatic sprayer, you're making a claim basically that you've improved the process of spraying by making it electrostatic. So right. show us your data. Right. So that just like you have to show data to register chemistry for disinfecting, I, I think you need to show that data if you're going to make claims about a sprayer. And it's actually pretty easy. So the University of Georgia created a protocol for how to measure spray deposition. It's not hard. We do it on every piece of equipment that we make because we're always trying to improve our equipment. But it uses basically a wooden post and you spray that wooden post from the front side and you measure how much spray went on the back side. And the reason it's wood is because we don't want to have conductive, superconductive targets that, you know, certain kinds of electrostatic sprayers only work on metal targets. And we're creating a disinfecting sprayer, so it needs to work on all kinds of targets. Hmm. So you create one that's not electrically grounded. So the target uh, is a wood piece of wood. And it's uh, how much spray goes on the back. And you, and you measure that with charging off and charging on. And you need to show a substantial increase in the spray deposition with the charging on versus charging off. We see typically anywhere from two to tenfold increases on spray deposition on the back sides of targets when we turn the charging on. That's what we see typically. Um, if you don't double it, what have you really done? But also there's been some work uh, here at, at BioPlanet on creating wetness sensors because you know with disinfecting, uh, we want to have certain dwell time and contact right. time with our chemistry. So uh, there's a need for a small device that you can put somewhere, you know, to train people on proper disinfecting. We've created a device like that and we used it and we found out that within a matter of minutes, we can train someone to do a better job disinfecting by simply observing the amount of wetness on a target. Hmm. So maybe that instead of the spray deposition, but we're not quite done with that device yet. And I may be talking in a turn, actually telling you we're working on it, but I think the industry <laughs> too late now <laughs> doesn't bother me. I think the industry needs standards. If, if manufacturers are going to make claims that the customer can't um, himself see. So, yeah. so it's important. So I've suggested to the EPA and to others uh, through the work at the university of Georgia that we simply start off with measuring spray charge and droplet size. Because if you have adequate charge and you have the right droplet size, you're going to be able to get good electrostatic coating. It's physics. It's F equals QE. So when I went to the ISSA show and I met with other people making electrostatic sprayers, I asked them, what's your charge level? What's your charge to mass ratio? Can I see your deposition data that would substantiate these claims? And I got blank stares. And that yeah. bothered me a lot because I want electrostatics to be an important technology that people can use in disinfecting. It's a very good technology, but I don't want equipment being sold that is actually going to kill the technology in the marketplace because it doesn't work. Yeah. And one of well, the think... things that we talked about was how a lot of what has happened with, let's just say, these inferior systems that Scott and I were kind of putting down is it it's kind of put a little black cloud over the whole term yeah. uh, electrostatic spraying and yeah. and we came to realize that that was not fair that was not a fair statement and yeah. you educated us on it so our hope was that this program hoping to uh, our hope was that it would make more transparency understand yeah. that there's a lot of differences and variances in electrostatics and even though electrostatic spraying is picked up kind of a a smear because of what's happened with some of the uh, manufacturers that that's not a fair statement about all. Yeah. And um, we felt that that was our, uh, our duty to our audience. Scott, was that yeah. a no, fair no, way to I, say I agree completely. I mean, we, we learned a lot uh, after the fact last week with our conversation with Steve and thought, well, if we're learning this info, we should share it out to our listening audience or viewing audience as well, because I'm just dumbfounded that the, some of these units are able to even be sold at all without some sort of somebody cracking down on them. Doesn't seem like there's any 
regulation involved with a device that you know people think it's doing something and it's not epa is really against that you know that's why you have to right. support efficacy data and all that and it's, it's no different than an atp meter i mean you can get certain data but you got to make sure don't take the data further than it's meant to go yeah uh, that's a good uh, everybody that's a good analogy. yeah if everybody thinks that it just because it says it's electrostatic that it actually does stuff um so yeah you i think you've helped uh clarify it a lot and we'll put some links uh below the show here for people to uh, reach out to you if you want and, and learn more about what you're well, doing at your company there. Thanks for having an open mind and inviting yeah. me. But, you know, in the end, this good science does win. And yeah. so, you know, um, it, it, I think it's a, a natural evolution of product uh, maturity to go through kind of this phase. But I do want the electrostatic technology to be used in disinfecting because it's such a powerful yeah. tool. Yeah. But remember, it's not it's not a magic wand. You have to have good tools and you have to have good training and you have to have good chemistries out there. Yeah. These things all have to work together. And, and I will, I will say that um, I'm a real fan of ISSA and their GBAC program mm -hmm. for, for product um, registration, because yeah. we've gone through that process and GBAC requires, uh, you know, you to substantiate your claims and it's a year long yeah. process to get a product really approved. And now we've been through that rigor and all of the bioplanet electrostatic sprayers do have the G the GBAC registration. And it's because we have the science that can back the claims. Yeah. So that in of itself is a standard, is a good standard to, to, to have equipment. I, I think all electrostatic sprayers, if you're going to call yourself an electrostatic sprayers, needs to run through that accreditation process. And GBAC is uh is doing a good job with that. Yeah. Good. Well, great show. Hope uh Hope uh, everybody learned a lot from it. And um, thank you very much for joining us, Steve, and, and making us aware that we didn't know what we were talking about. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hopefully we'll talk again. Okay. Right. See y'all. Thank you, Steve. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.